shift your mindset to how can I identify, understand, and manage risk in my decision making so that I can take bigger risks. The entire goal is to be able to jump on bigger opportunities. Yes. And the way to do that is to really have the support underneath there. Hey. Welcome to the most wonderful real estate podcast ever. I am Dwan Ben Twyford. I'm your host. I'm America's most sought after real estate investor. And I am so excited that you're here today as I'm interviewing one of my wicked smart men. So we have a great interview coming up for you today. Our motto at Dwanderful is people before profits. So that's something that resonates with you. This is it. I'm your girl. You're at the right place. And this is your right time. So my guest today is Jeremy Goodrich. So Jeremy, welcome to the show today. Juan, it's so awesome to be here. I'm excited to get to speak with you, get to speak with your community, share a little bit about my journey, and hopefully help some listeners out. Yeah, that's always the goal here at Wonderful. So we always start off having a toast. So uh, what are you drinking? I am drinking. I have a Canada Dry here. Okay, I have a live enzyme drink. So I'll start with that. So toast, okay. here's to you. Thank you for being on my show. Absolutely. Cheers to you as well. And everybody. I always make know, sure that we're speaking, we're, we're, we're making eye contact. So I did the best I could there. That's right. So everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> Shake off whatever you got going on. Get rid of any negativity, whatever you got happening in your life right now. Take it off. Put some time aside and just have fun with us and learn and listen and laugh. And you'll be super happy that you listen to the podcast today. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Jerry. So the first thing we like to do is just briefly, I want you to tell us your name, how we reach you and what you do in like two sentences. And then I'm going to ask a bunch of questions and we're going to kind of backtrack. We're going to find out how you got to be Jeremy Goodrich. Absolutely. So uh, you find me at shineinsurance.com. I am a risk manager and insurance advisor who connects with people from a teacher's heart because an elementary school teacher is what I was for 13 years before starting my agency. Nice. Okay. And how? And so shineinsurance.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. I love it. How old are you? Can I ask? 46. I'm 46. I'm going to ask anyway. So yeah, um, no, I mean, the beard is gray. The, the hair is still, you know, not, it's, you know, it's still sticking around. But I uh, got so yeah. much gray underneath his hair. I tell you what, when COVID started, I couldn't get my hair done. And uh -huh. all my hair started growing out. I was like, what the hell? And then I, you know, I had been putting uh -huh. brown on it. And then yeah. I, you know, it's like this long. And I was like, oh my God, my hair is gray. So I thought, you know what? Uh, yeah. I'm just going to my mess around, have some fun colors, and see what happens. And then I decided I like pink. So I stuck with it. I think it looks great. I love it. Yeah, I was helping I my wife during COVID. It's so much fun. It's like, this is the most fun hair I've ever had. I love it. Yeah, I think you it's made a good choice. Shockingly gray underneath. <laughs> 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 okay, so tell me, Shine Insurance. Um, so you said that you do risk. Yeah, like commercial real estate risk management. So we focus okay. specifically. So, risk, so commercial yep. real estate risk management. So tell me what that is, because I don't exactly know exactly what that is. Yeah. So it's like, you know, when you're uh, when you think about any opportunity you have, whether that's to go out and buy some commercial real estate, whether that's to go out for dinner on a Saturday night, there's a balance of opportunity, the thing that you want to do that's positive, mm -hmm. and risk, the thing that could potentially go wrong as a part of that opportunity. And so we're balancing those two things in everything we do. I watched a movie recently, the um, Top Gun 2. I don't know if you watched that movie. With oh, Tom I Cruise have not. The, we can't go out to yeah. movies yet. With yeah. what we're doing. It's like I'm dying to see that movie. Yeah, so it's a great example, right? And I won't give anything away for your listeners, but essentially they have a mission. No one's surprised that a movie about like military airplanes, there's some mission. It's a big mission. It seems impossible. There's no way they could do it. And somehow over the course of the, the, sh the movie, you see success happen right and that's an example of just like huge risk that you're taking in a airplane going Mach 9 or whatever obviously most of the decisions we're making are not that extreme but we are making decisions all the time that involve risk 
how does an airplane pilot manage risk? Well, they do lots of things to make sure they understand how to run the plane. They understand that all the systems are working, all that kind of stuff. Risk management at its bottom line is just making sure that everything is working properly so that we can succeed in our opportunities. And so what I do with investors is I talk about financial risk. I talk about property rich risk. I talk about relationship risk. I talk about systems risks and I talk about external risks. I just help I them walk that. through that. I love that. So if I want to buy a commercial building and I call you up and let's say, and it's a six story commercial multi-use building. Sure. What would I be worried about risk wise? So, I mean, the first thing we talk about is risk as a whole. Obviously, as an insurance advisor, I focus mostly on the property risk, right? If that six-story building had a, a fire happen, um, I had a claim recently happen where someone who owned us, it was, I think, 10-story building, but similar type of building, office building in that scenario, had someone uh, use the bathroom on a Friday night before leaving, and that toilet overflowed, kept op- overflowing no one saw it because everyone had left the building until Sunday morning when there was water pouring out the front door of the building, right? So that's a lot of damage coming from a third floor pipe, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. That's what we think about when we worry about risk, right? The risk of a fire, the risk of that type of example. Um, the risk of someone coming to a real retail shop on a snowy day and slipping and falling, falling. and uh, you know them finding a personal injury attorney who decides to sue for millions of dollars, right? Um, these are the physical risks uh, associated with owning a commercial property and probably the thing that most people think of coming and talking to me about, but there's and also- you offer the insurance. And then we, yeah, we offer the insurance. Yeah. Uh, but on the highest le- higher level, it's also, hey, do you have contracts in place with your tenants that look really good? Um, do you have contracts in place with your subcontractors? Do you pro- do your property managers have uh, systems in place where if it snows, they immediately have ice melt down so there aren't those slip and falls? Do your hallways have security systems? Do they have railings? Do you have two day two ways out of a building? On and on, right? And so risk management is really about all of those check boxes so that we can fly our commercial real estate airplane. So we can make sure that everything's good so we can go on that mission and you know make sure it's profitable, make sure it's safe for our tenants and safe for our investors because we're protecting their money by making sure we have a, a risk management strategy. I, you know, I, I love that you do that because I know so many, so I was asking you about that because uh, I have a, a commercial building like that and we had somebody on... And then the third floor used the bathroom on a weekend and it leaked all weekend, but it leaked down through somebody else's apartment. Of course, right. Yeah. Below that was somebody's business. And it was like, how did this happen? And so I had that exact, when you said that, I started laughing. Like, I had that exact thing happen. It's super common. It's a but super it common claim. The yeah. apartment and down through the girl at the bottom had a hair salon. And the whole thing was just wrecked. It's like, uh, how did nobody know that? Yeah, absolutely. But it and then happen. you. You potentially lose. So you think about what your losses are in that situation. One is just damage to the building, right? Like you got to deal with all the things to fix the damage to the building. The other loss is the possible loss of income if it takes a period of time. I had a similar situation recently where uh, downstairs was a restaurant and then upstairs was an apartment which was uh, in a college town. And so it was like college kids. And at, above that on like a flat roof, there was this like cool atrium, glassed in atrium where you could like grow plants and stuff like that. Oh, really neat, like on the roof, really good idea. Except when they built it, they ran a water pipe up into it. The college kids went home for Christmas as one college kid does, right? Yeah. Goes home, And they thought it was a good idea to turn off the heat. And for your listeners who are apartment owners who have college kids, they're all groaning right now because almost everyone who's ever done student rentals knows about, you know, in cold climates, knows about students turning off the heat in their apartment when they leave to go home for a couple of weeks. So that pipe in the atrium on the top burst because it got cold. Water went all the way down into, just same as you were saying, into the, the restaurant Long story short, the restaurant was closed for five months. Oh, no. Because of all the way they had built that building and the way the insulation has had been done between the restaurant and the upstairs apartment, they had to tear out everything. 
And oh, so no. now your tenants have lost income. That's their own insurance problem. But then yeah. you also lost their income from, you know, them paying rent. Either they can't pay rent or they can't live there. And so the lease there. leases them. So insurance can deal with that. It's called loss of income coverage. That's another way of mitigating the risk of losing your income um, and making sure that you get that income, even though it doesn't come from your tenant, it comes from the insurance claim. No, I love that. I, I know, I mean, everybody I know just about buys foreclosures and, you know, so we buy a lot of them sight unseen off auctions and, and we bought a couple of buildings sight unseen. And then you get there and you're like, oh my God, look at this building. Because <laughs> so, people, you know, that don't think they think about like all those other things, like you mentioned. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. It, water is just a beast, man. You know, I mean, you think about just a little leak from a shower or just a little bit of a little crack in the shower uh, caulk and water is just slowly running down a, a wall for who knows how long until you're in real trouble. So water, I mean, water is probably 60, 70 percent of the claims that I see. It, it, and, you know, it's funny, year, years ago, like 25 years ago, um, I was rehabbing houses. So I bought a house that had fire damage. So the insurance company was a home, single family home, and it had started a fire in the master bedroom. So the insurance company came in and redid the electricity and like redid the master, but they only redid that one area of the house and the rest of it was exactly the same. Right. And I knew nothing about fire damage or water damage at that point. So I'm looking through, I'm like, okay, the electrical's good. This is good. That's good. You know, I'm going to buy this house. I'm going to fix it up and da, 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 da. So yeah. the first day that I go back to really look at it, for some reason, which this is something I never do, I leaned against the wall and I kind of crossed my arms and leaned against the wall and I was just assessing. I literally crashed through the wall. Oh no. And I was like, so I did not realize all the water damage on all the drywall turns it to dust. Uh huh. And the whole house, mm -hmm. every inch of that drywall was like dust. And I was like, oh, that's oh, interesting. God. So you had purchased the house. So the claim was the former. Uh, owner. And so you really couldn't go back to the insurance company and say, Hey, there's more damage than you saw. Right. No. Yeah. Because had I had a chance to do all my inspections. I was like, yeah, that looks fine. I had someone look at the electrical because you could see where they had redone the master bath and the, repainted the walls and, you know, fixed all the damage, but they didn't do anything else into the rest of the house. So it never dawned on me that, mm. you know, they put out a fire over the whole roof and the right. whole inside of the house got wet. And there was uh -huh. so much damage. And I thought, what the hell? So I always tell people, listen, fire damage is nothing compared to water. Water Absolutely. is an enemy. Yeah. And I, I wonder in that scenario, now I'm not sure what would have happened, but you could potentially still go back to the insurance company because the date of loss was prior to your purchase. I would be interested what the insurance company would have said had you gone back to them and said, hey, this claim is not done yet. There is more damage than we thought from that situation. And I really want to reopen this claim. Um, I don't know and if the I transfer. I a guy like you. Yeah. I was still a new investor and I didn't even know enough to know that. Mm -hmm. so, that so once I got w working with different insurance people and, and learning more about the stuff, it's like, man, I bought a lot of houses that had all kinds of stuff wrong that really should have already been fixed. Right. When I took it on. But see, now that's like not knowing cost me a bunch of money. Yeah. And that's why I like what you do, because if people will just look at everything first, they would maybe not buy something or buy it for a lesser value or have better insurance to cover things. Because I, I know that from the few buildings that I have, water is always the worst thing. Yeah. Water I is top, so damaging. Uh... I talk a lot about there's there's really three steps to managing risk. And this is, again, back to making good decision. That's all we're talking okay, about. Give us making... three, my next question is, give us an actionable tip, but give us the three steps. All right. I'm going to do it right here. So, you know, I think anytime we're talking about managing risk, it, it, it's these three steps. The first is you have to identify the risk. Right. If you haven't identified it in the case of your example, you didn't know that that drywall was going to fall apart because you really hadn't identified all the things that had come from that fire, uh, putting out that fire in that situation. Right. So step one is identifying. Very simple. We have to understand. We have to figure out what it is. Step two is understanding. Right. When we identify, um, I'm learning how to play piano right now. And I identified that, that was something I wanted to learn how to do. Right. I said, I want to learn how to play piano. 
So the next thing I have to do is understand what it means to do that. What, what resources am I going to use? How am I going to dig into that? Podcasts like this one are a great way for you to start to understand things associated with the risk of investing in real estate, whether that's you know wholesaling, whether that's buying sight unseen like you've done, whether that's buying commercial real estate, um, you really want to start to understand. So identify understand, and then you manage. Now that you have identified and understood, we can decide how to manage your thing. You know, if you're, if the risk is an external risk, like a market uh -huh. and you're looking at a market and it's a one employer market and that employer is a military base. And you're thinking about buying an a, a apartment complex in that area. Well, you've identified the risk, right? The risk is that it's a one employer town. And the ways to manage that risk are pretty limited, right? The risk is out of your control. So there's, or excuse me, the ways of, uh, yeah, the ways of managing the risk are pretty limited. Like yeah. if it either goes or stays. So this is a pretty hard and fast situation. There's not much to understand. We identified the issue and we either have to take the risk or not take the risk. We either have to buy the property or not to buy the property and know that if we buy the property, we're out of, you know, there is something external that's not in our control. But most risks are a little bit more, uh, you know, there, there's more to understanding them. Um, and that's why it's so important to do all the front end work when you're looking at a property and you're really doing your due diligence and walking through that process, right? Due diligence is simply an exercise in managing risk in identifying, understanding, and thinking about how you can manage a risk. And we give a billion examples, but that is definitely my actionable item is, you know, start thinking in that way, shift your mindset to how can I identify, understand and manage risk in my decision making so that I can take bigger risks. The entire goal is to be able to, you know, uh, jump on bigger opportunities. Yes. And the way to do that is to really have the, 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 the support underneath there. And so your job, so I, I, I love what you do. I, I, you know, you're the very first person I've interviewed that does like this risk management stuff. So, uh, so I, I, I always like to hear what people do and then ask questions like I would ask if I was meeting you for the first, like, oh, what would I want to know about that? Right. Yeah. So you guys do, so you work nationwide. Correct. Okay. So I just make sure because, you know, I have people from all over the place listening here. Of course. Yeah. Nationwide deal. So that's good. And then do you work specifically like with investors or just regular homeowners or do you have a niche? Yeah, I, I work specifically with asset managers who have at least 100 units um, of commercial real estate. That could be multifamily, office, retail, industrial, self-storage. They have 100 units. Yeah. Nice. nice. So the portfolios that I take care of are you know anywhere from 100 units up to 5,000 units is probably my largest client. So anywhere in between there um, are, are the folks that we focus on. Nice. And so then you guys do the assessment, do this, do that. And then you provide the insurance. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. You know, I mean, like, Hey, I need all these things done to make this property to be uh, insurable or whatever. But do you ever sit and talk to people and say like, listen, this has all these things wrong with it. I don't think this is a good investment for you. Do you ever actually kind of coach them on whether it's, it's not as good of an investment as they thought it might be? Yeah. I mean, sometimes it depends on the relationship I have with the client, right? I mean, it, there are absolutely clients I have that want my insight on investing in general. Um, yeah. Most of my clients want specific insight on risk management. And if I'm going through the process and saying, well, you know, look, you're purchasing this property. Historically, it's in a fairly high crime community. You know, that's not a problem, but we, we want to make sure that we have some systems in place to make sure that the, your, your tenants have a feeling of safety and experience yeah. safety in this space. It's of utmost importance as compared to maybe a neighborhood that doesn't have as much crime as a part of it. That's one example, right? Where it's like, wh what are you going to do? And if someone says, well, I don't know, I'm not that worried about it, then we're probably not a good fit. So there's certainly times when you I are say, worried about it. If something happens, you <laughs> got to pay that claim out. Yeah. Well, and sometimes I'm, <laughs> I'm, I am here, like I'm a member of your team and that's the difference between how we work and how a lot of insurance agents work. Like I'm not schlepping quotes. I'm not interested in trying to work to the bottom of the barrel and just get your business so that then something bad happens and your policy doesn't take care of you. Like I want to think holistically about what's going on on your property. And if you don't care about the safety of your tenants, then I'm not interested in working with you. It's just like that, that that's bottom line, right? You said at the beginning of this show, like this show is about, 
about how to invest and lift people up at the same time. Okay. One of the core tenets of Shine Insurance and what we do is that we rise by lifting others. And I think that that's one of the wonderful things about commercial real estate is you see great investors doing that. Um, and we want to be a part of those teams. But yeah, if I'm having a risk management conversation with someone and they're not interested in the safety of their tenants, especially when I'm telling them it will also make their insurance a ton cheaper and they'll get right. a better policy, then it's, it's probably not a fit. Yeah, we had, we bought one, we, we bought some buildings in the last couple of years in a little town called Clinton, Iowa. Okay. So my husband's from Clinton, Iowa. And so we go back to all of our high school reunions. So we go back to his reunions and this little downtown, it's right on the river in the midst of the river. And it's like this little town that literally it's like time for God. People have owned buildings for decades. They've never improved them. There's a few buildings that people own that have active running businesses. But for the most part, the downtown is kind of just, you know, it's there's not very many people down there. So we start yeah. talking to the downtown partnership and they said, oh, this is an opportunity zone. We have grants for this, grants for that. Da, 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 da. So we're like, okay, we're going to buy a couple of buildings. Well, yeah. My husband and I, uh, we are a little bit the type that go all in and maybe too much all in. So the course yeah. of the last five years, we bought 20 buildings. <laughs> <laughs> like, all in like, the same downtown? Yes. We okay. are okay, highly yeah. invested in this town like this town. But actually, we just found out um, this last week that the, the values of the downtown in just the last three years have gone up 38%. Great. And I think that's Absolutely. because of all the work that we're doing on these buildings. But yeah. one building in specific is a four-story building. So it's like commercial downstairs, tenants up here, the second floor. Third floor is people that would have like just like a little office. Yeah, like maybe an insurance office where they don't need like a storefront, just a little office, and then a restaurant on the top. And so one of the things I noticed, like right out of the gate, was that people just come in and out the door all the time. Just in and out, in and out, in and out. I'm like, but I know I understand the people on the third floor have offices, but the people on the second floor live there mm -hmm. and the doors are never locked. Yeah. So we were like, mm. so the third floor people were super mad that we're like, now nope, we're changing all the locks. Everyone's got to have a key. We're not going to put a buzzer. No one's going to buzz people in. Like it's a restaurant. It's like all these things. And I'm, and I'm like, all these people on the second floor are exposed all the time. So we yeah. start locking it and just getting a bunch of things done and put cameras everywhere. And I have the little cameras that can follow you around and I can talk in and say like, Hey, what are you doing in the back of my, in my alley? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. so sometimes on the weekends I get on the camera and I'm like watching people walking around, like get away from my building. <laughs> oh my God. I'm like, I'm a nut over it now. But well, yeah, that, that seems was... like almost a, a problem with the organization of the building, right? Like when you've got, residential and then you've got office above residential and people have to pass by the residential to get to the office i mean that probably is just because it's been that way for years and for some and the reason the building's old the building's yeah. like 80 years old but what we did is, is on the first floor in the back there's a, 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 a someone had boarded up a wall to make a bigger space but behind that is a back entryway to come into the building that can get you upstairs without mm -hmm. going past the people so we spent uh, yeah. a bunch of money, opened up this hallway, made an entryway in the back for the businesses and in the front for the people and put up some uh, big um, gates that are mm -hmm. locked. And like we separate all that. But it costs a lot of money to do that. Right. And but, you know, I as I've been thinking about that, I'm like, gosh, if I lived on there and people just coming and going and coming and going and anyone can get into the building, I would hate that. Absolutely. And I think what you just described is a great example of a risk management strategy where you were like, okay, here's an issue that I see with this particular property. What am I going to do about it? How am I going to play this out? My choices are I could do nothing that could have, you know, certain kinds of ramifications, something bad could happen. Ten tenants yeah. maybe don't want to live there in the same way they wouldn't want to pay maybe the kind of rent that I want to charge for this thing to work. Um, you know, that's one strategy though, is to do nothing. And then your what you just described for your listeners is a strategy of how to really like deeply address the situation, yeah. um, at the cost, at a cost to yourself. And hopefully you're looking at the entire picture and your pro pro forma as a whole is still a profitable pro, pro forma. I'm sure it is. it is. Um, it becomes a part of your business plan. You just gave yeah. an example of how you apply risk management strategies to your business plan to hopefully make it more profitably yeah. profitably. I don't even know if that's a word. It Profit. is a word. We're going to make Over it a word. Time. Hey, it's wonderful is not a word either. I took Dwan and wonderful 
and uh-huh. make new words. So we're yep. we're all about making new words around here. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love a it. Bunch of uh, buildings that have like commercial downstairs and apartments upstairs, but most of them there's a a door, right? That goes up a hallway and the apartments are there. And this one was like just all in. I was thinking, you know, I didn't have been that way for I don't even know how long forever. The one that owned it before me has had it like forty years. Right. Wow. Like you know, I just I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe forty years ago things were safer. But I'm of that mindset. Like I watch too much crime TV. <laughs> I know what's happening out there. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah so it's I always like balance. Life. It's always a balance, right? You're always trying to figure out what makes the most sense for that property. And I bet we could go through all your properties and you would have done different things for different properties. Sometimes there's just a process you do every single time. Maybe you remodel, maybe your turnover, you know, has, I'm going to spend 15 K if it's a thousand square feet or smaller or whatever your game is, uh-huh. but there's, you know, a different strategy for every property, yeah. which in some ways is why larger multifamily is so attractive in a lot of ways, because while there's problems in and of the, itself for that stuff, you can create a lot of reoccurring activities and behaviors when it comes to renovation, when it comes to yeah. safety, when it comes to leasing agreements and everything else, you know? Yeah, no, I love that. So I, I do love that. So I'm going to ask you, so let's, let's go back. Let's go back to the younger Jeremy. When you yeah. were like 14, 15, what were you doing? Where were you living? What was going on? There were only two things that I really cared about. Uh, well, there were probably more than that. But when I was younger, I was I had just moved from San Diego, California. I grew up in San Diego, was like a little surfer and all that kind of stuff. And then my uh, parents decided to move us from San Diego, California to Indianapolis, Indiana, with pretty much no notice. You must have um, hated that. I'm still mad at them about no. I'm the just beach to like the middle <laughs> of the Midwest. Oh my uh, god, I would have been so mad at my parents. Yeah. So I had just, that had just happened. And so there was like that change in my life, but I really got focused. I had always been focused on sports. I've always played sports since I was four years old. And um, so that continued to be a big focus, soccer and baseball primarily. Um, I couldn't surf anymore. So soccer and baseball, I tried basketball cause that's kind of a Midwest thing and not a West coast thing. And I was terrible at it cause I hadn't been playing it my whole life. Um, but then I had kind of an entrepreneurial thread that started right around there too. Just like so many young kids at that age, I used my parents' lawnmower to mow three or four other people's yards. I turned that into enough money to buy one of those commercial walk behind mowers that I would then ride down multiple streets. I had like 50 different clients. Uh Um, So I would mow yards after school. I would mow yards on weekends. And the idea of mowing yards and lawn and landscape carried all the way through into uh, adulthood. Uh, When I was an elementary school teacher, I taught school all day Uh and then I got out and I got in my truck with my trailer, with my uh, lawn equipment and I mowed until dark. And um, Uh that was, so I've, I've been an entrepreneur pretty much my whole life. And then in 2013, I started shine and uh, this is what I've been doing for the last 10 years. So did you go into real estate investing? Did you uh, do you own your own uh, investing rentals and things like that? Did you get into investing or did you just love being on the other side of it? Uh, I'm a passive investor, so I don't have any of my own rent- rentals. My my active income, I really believe everyone has to have two forms of income. One is an active form of income coming yeah. in from whatever you're trading your time for. And then the other is passive income. And hopefully as you're building that passive income, as I'm sure you talk about on your show all the time, there starts to become more and more till there's a point where that passive income covers your expenses. And yeah. that's when you're financially free, right? Yeah. And so I don't have any interest in being a general partner in commercial real estate deals or flipping or wholesaling or doing any of the active role in the real estate world. I am a service provider to the real estate industry from the risk management and insurance perspective. That is my active income and that's my business. And then I take that money and I invest passively in real assets. So I have investments in apartment complexes and I have investments in some other real assets, um, oil and gas, uh, carbon capture is one asset that I'm invested in. Um, so that's how I'm building passive income, uh, through the active role of the insurance agency and then the passive role of investing as an LP. I like that. And, you know, I tell people, you know, cause I, I teach just a kajillion workshops And one of the very first things I tell everyone is you have to have a team like you Mm -hmm. investing is not a soul. You cannot be an investor by yourself. If you think you're just going to be the lone ranger, go do it all by yourself. It doesn't work that way. You have to have insurance. You have to have mortgage brokers. You need to have some contractors. You need uh, an investor friendly real estate agent. Like you need a good title company. 
you need a team and and actually having like the insurance what you do in my list of teams i have that as listed as one of the people that you need to have on your team because you cannot do it all yeah and and if and so i always tell people like learn a little bit like learn a little bit about what jeremy does learn a little bit about what the title company does learn a little bit about what they do so you know that they're covering you but don't become an expert at everybody else's job and then you're not doing the thing that you want to do but you have to be uh, somewhat knowledgeable. Like I know what the job of a title company is. So if I see a bunch of crazy extra fees, it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, What's yeah. all this? I know what this is. What is this? So I know that. But do I want to learn how to do that? Hell no. That's much paperwork. No. That. that is not yeah. my thing. I know what realtors do. Do I want to be a realtor? No. I do not want to let people around show houses. <laughs> but insurance? No. But I know that I can't have a house without having insurance. So yeah, I think I, I'll give you one more actionable thing. Um, you know, I, I, there's three E's in success and really in any business. Um, certainly real estate fits this as well. And that is education, experience, and entourage. And I think that this journey, people get caught up in some of these different things, right? The first thing you do, and if you're listening to this podcast and you have not yet gone out and invested in real estate, you are still in the first E. You're still doing just education, right? And you're listening to podcasts and you're reading books and you're you're getting smarter about the thing, but you have to leap. And I'm sure you've talked about this on the show as well. You have to leap to experience. You have to get that experience because that ultimately gives you the things that you need to be able to grow, right? So education and experience are two things you can do inside your own human body. Yeah. You have, you can trade your time for this stuff and you can go do this, but that is not how you scale. Maybe you can buy one property. Maybe you can figure out a, a few small things, but ultimately you're going to hit a wall and it's the wall of the time that you have available as a human. The yeah. biggest, most successful full commercial real estate investors and entrepreneurs in general, for that matter, understand the third E and that is entourage. And that is how you become scalable, right? You start saying not only to your service team, but also to other people, how can I duplicate myself? Okay. I'm not going to become an insurance person. I'm not going to become an expert. I'm going to find someone I love. I'm not going to go out and find properties and be boots on the ground everywhere. I'm going to make relationships with brokers and realtors. You know, I'm not going to figure out how to run my own books. I'm going to hire a bookkeeper. Um, and then you, I'm not going to raise capital for myself. I know someone who's much better at social media and connecting with people and knows lots of doctors. And so I'm going to bring in a capital raiser to my GP team, right? You're building that entourage and that is how scale scalability works. And once you're scalable, scalable, then the sky is the limit, you know, yep. and you can just move as fast as you can get people to move. You know, I have to tell you, I use the word team player. So they started using that word back a million years ago. I like the word entourage better. It sounds more bougie. The thing I'm going to start saying, listen, you need to have an entourage. Well, I needed sense. three E's. I like, yeah. I had the first two E's and I needed, needed a third. No, e. education, experience, and entourage. Now, entourage <laughs> sounds way more bougie. I'm going to say, yeah. using the word entourage, I'm like, ah, oh, screw the team players. You need an entourage. That's right. You need way an entourage. Way more bougie. And if you think about your entourage, the nice thing about it is, you know, in an entourage scenario, you um, still are the, and, and I don't think it's a great idea to, it, from, from a mindset perspective to make yourself the center. But right, like an entourage is is a group of people who are helping you lift a concept that yeah. might be centered around your brand, uh, your personality. That's perfectly fine. But, you know, it, it's lifting you and everyone else with it. And it is. And, you know, and I always tell everyone, it's like, listen, just because you're the investor or you own the apartment or whatever, you're you're not the top dog because you can't do it without everybody else. So right. you have to find the best in the other field because you're really only as good as your team. Yep. You're only as good as your entourage. So if you have right. people that are like, eh, so so, then it, it hurts you trying to grow what you're doing. And you need to, and I always say, surround yourself with the very best people. Don't hire some CPA that charges you 50 bucks to do your taxes. You need someone that's charging like 500 bucks an hour because they're deep diving into what you need to do and they're helping you with your money. Like you need to hire like the real people. And so I like that. Education, yeah, you, experience, and entourage. Okay, I'm stealing the word entourage. I'm just telling you right now. I love it. You know, you, you, I think you, there's a level of you get what you pay for. And then that conversation, and there's a level of, you know, when you go somewhere that's maybe just a little bit more expensive than somewhere else, oftentimes the rest of the crowd, the other people who need that same service or the same person are going to the cheaper person. And so you have engaged with someone you've, you've paid extra 
to have more focus from someone. You do. You get more focus. They'll take your calls easier. And no, I'm always like, listen, the, the cheapest, and I want to buy a house as cheap as possible. Certainly. Sure. But all right. the people around me, I don't want the people that are like setting up a booth at Walmart to do people's taxes. Like that's not the person for me. I yeah. need like the I need the people. So let me ask you this. We're gonna we're gonna jump off that for a minute. Uh, yeah. What's your favorite band? What's your favorite band of all time? Uh, so I'm kind of a deadhead. So I'm kind of into the Grateful Dead. Um, and so I'm gonna go with that off the top of my head. Um, I have uh a lot of different types of music I like, but definitely. You know, when I, I was in high Grateful school, Dead. yeah, when I was in high school, I was like the dude with really long hair and, and big baggy overalls. And <laughs> um, I, I didn't really take care of my hair very well. And so Did um, you have, like, I would, dreads? no, no dreads, but I had a hair tie and like, I, you know, most folks that have hair that are listening right now, they can say, okay, well, I tie my hair tie, you know, three times you flip it over three times or maybe two times, depends on how thick your hair is, all those kinds of things. Right. Well, I, t I probably flipped my hair tie 12 times because there was so little hair in it because I had so many <laughs> broken hairs and just, you know, so it was like a puff of hair. <sighs> yeah, I was a mess in high school. Um, <sighs> but I, you know, there were a lot of things I connected with at that point and just said, well, I, I've always felt like regular, you know, society and capitalism and stuff is always, I've always had just a little bit of a problem, although obviously I'm part of commercial real estate world. So, uh, you know, I'm comfortable with that piece. I like so, the Grable Dead. I only saw them in concert once, but you, yeah. could, you could just see like the family that they, they created around their music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, it's really something. They were, they were really... They were really a one of a kind, like their fans were family. Yeah. You and know? it's such, you know, the, the Grateful Dead is such a great example of brand. And for anybody listening to you sh your show, who's trying to build a brand, you know, it's like, okay, who are we? Anytime you see a really, really good brand, whether that's a Patagonia or Nike or the Grateful Dead or, you know, other wonderful. big brands, there's some story behind that of someone who was just themselves who just said, I believe in, and it was X. And this is the why behind what I do. Yeah. And I believe in what I do and I'm going to do it this way. And I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm going to drive down that road. And I think that's one lesson you get from good, great brands, the Grateful Dead yeah. being one um, is, you know, know your why really understand what is the purpose behind what you're doing? Yes. Money is a part of that, but if money is your why it, it's, it's not enough, you no, know, there, there has enough. to be more. Yeah. If you do the why for all the right reasons, I just believe if you do good, good comes back. So if you do it for the right reasons, the money will come. Mm -hmm. Money is like the after effect of you doing the things the way you do it. And I couldn't be agree with you more. I'm like, listen, I don't I have my hair thing. And I'm not talking to people. Like, I don't care what you think about me. I am who I am. And if you don't like this, that's okay. I'm not for everybody. Then don't show up. And that's a really I'm good. For. Yeah. If you don't repel someone, then you're not attracting anyone. Yeah. So it's like, I'm not for everybody, certainly, but the people that, that work with me, they love me. They're like, Oh my God, you're so real. It's like, I really am. Like I really am. And I'm, who, and I'm willing to like live in my truth. Be I my person. So, and I, I like that. that, but I've been that way forever. So, you know, back like 30 years ago, women that were trailblazing in the real estate industry, there were not very many of us. Yeah. So I was sort of like a lone wolf, but now there's more. And it's like, even back then I thought, well, I don't care that men do this more than women. And I like doing this and that's what I'm going to do. So watch me. Okay. Yeah. I love the Grateful Dead. Music. The thing I would like to ask people about their music, because you can tell a lot about a person by the music they listen to. Yeah, absolutely. And when you said that, like I, in my mind, I have a vision of you now as a person that's like out and about because music, I, I feel like music is like, you know, it is the international language. I mean, I'm like crazy music person. Um, yeah, I'm learning how to play. I'm learning how to play Desperate, the Eagle song Desperado right uh, now on the piano. piano. Remember I said I was trying to learn how to play piano. And so, you know, when you're learning a song and uh, anyone who plays music, I'm sure understands uh, it's to get stuck in your head. So yeah. my, uh, if your question had been what song is stuck in your head right now, it would be uh, the Eagles Desperado. <laughs> Desperado. So that might be a good that's, question. I might start having to ask that on my podcast. That might be a good question too. Yeah, what's your, what song? Is, I always have a song stuck in my head. The yeah, problem is yeah. you hear a little piece of it somewhere and then it's just stuck right there it's like oh, oh that's the worst making me crazy yeah when a song is stuck in your head that you only know one part of 
you know, like you only know the bridge or whatever. And it's just like, then it's even more repetition. So yeah, it is. it's funny. You know, I, I, I follow some guy on TikTok that uh, is some kind of psychologist. And he said, if you have a song stuck in your head, if you'll go on and like listen to the whole song all the way through and sing all the words, it'll get unstuck because you're only stuck on the part that you know. Yeah. No, I haven't I, done that yet. But I do that all the time. I do that all the time. It, I, I never knew there was any works. psychology it behind work. it. Yeah, I, I'm always like, if I'm just humming a song sitting at my desk or whatever, I'll pull up Spotify and just play it. Because I'm like, well, if it's stuck in my head, I may as well get the real music of it and it sing is. it out. And But I guess there's some element of getting it out of your head, too. So I learned no, something. I don't know. I just saw that the other day and I thought, huh, I, I'm going to admit. Like, but I don't know. When I have a song stuck in my head, whatever it is, it's like it's bouncy or something. And I'm like, oh, I like it. And then, you know, something else rolls in. So tell me what's your favorite food? Uh, I'm kind of a pizza person. So I grew up in a family where, uh, food was not, uh, tasty, not, I'm a preacher's kid and I like church food. I, well, there's lots of different types of church food. My, my church food was very bland, very simple. So I can eat anything. Um, my family absolutely loves, uh, feeding me. They don't love it when I cook as much. Um, but I, I will eat absolutely anything. Um, but you know, pizza is a good, good one. Pizza. Um, we do a lot of Thai food. I oh. do like pad Thai and stuff like that. Some kinds of curries sometimes. Yeah, Indian last night. It's like, oof, I love it. Mm, yeah. What absolutely. is your favorite time of day? What's your favorite part of the day? Like throughout the day, what's your favorite part of the day? I love the first moment in the morning. Uh, I love, so I wake up, I generally write a LinkedIn post and I'm not the kind of person who writes my posts ahead of time. I'd probably be a little more consistent if I did. Um, but I, I wake up and, and I think that's the time that I just feel the most alive and the most creative. And, you know, by the time you get past noon and you're realizing all the things you were hoping to get done in that day, aren't going to get done. And you, uh, you know, the afternoon starts to feel like a, a slog a lot. And, uh, so I, I just, I love the morning. I love being up. I love being creative in that time. Nice, nice. I know, I love that too. Okay, so one more time, because uh, I want your information in the show notes a few times. People reach you at shineinsurance.com. Yeah, yeah, folks can reach me at shineinsurance.com. There's a pretty cool tool on there. If you are investing in multifamily, I know you have listeners all over the place, all but if you're place. investing in, in multifamily, there's a really simple tool at shineinsurance.com slash ballpark where you can answer nine yes or no questions and get an insurance ballpark for how much it will cost to have insurance on a given property. It's a really nice way to just get a number for your penciling while you're working through uh, the I potential of a deal and take it. Insurance.com forward slash ballpark. Answer the question and you get like a ball. That is brilliant. There you go. So brilliant. Just I love it. Easy I way to finish it. out your pro forma. Yeah, that, I love that. I, I might go on there and just mess around and see what I get. Yeah, right, just so, bookmark it. Um, so on the, uh, so I ask a lot of questions. We call this session when I interview people, we call Inside the Minds of Today's Millionaires. Yeah. Anyway, I just try to find out like what people are and what they're about and, and what they do and, and just, you know, have fun like we did today. So I took some notes. So I'm just going to see if I can do a little bit of a summary. Yeah. And you can tell me if I was able to get inside the mind of Jeremy Goodrich like this much. So 46, uh, shineinsurance.com, which I love that. You do risk management. Love that. Um, uh, I wrote a couple of notes about property inspections, insurance, due diligence, due diligence is oh, so important. I can attest the lack of due diligence. So many times <laughs> over. Um, you lived in well, San Diego. Well, if you're buying sight unseen, sorry to interrupt you, but if you're buying sight unseen a lot, then yeah, due diligence isn't happening that much. <laughs> it's not. I'm, I'm getting to where now I'm getting a little bit shy about it. Yeah. Um, so when you were younger, <laughs> you were in San Diego, Went from the beach to the Midwest, which had to be like a super culture shock. Uh, yeah. Played soccer, played baseball, and you mowed lawns. And you bought a walking mower, and you liked mowing lawns, and you ended up being a school teacher, and we're still taking care of yards and doing things like that. You do asset management for people that have 100 units or more. And I like the three E's, education, experience, and entourage. Mm -hmm. That's really, really great. And for your personal self, you are in some apartments, some oil, gas, some carbon uh, capturing. So those are all really super cool things too. And the actual tips are identify the risks, understand what it means, and then how to manage it. I love 100%. that. Grateful yeah. Dead, pizza, love the morning. It's about right. This is, is that about story. you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's so much yep. fun. 
You yeah. are so fun and so interesting. And I'm always really excited when I get to meet someone new that now I get to have a contact with you. And and I'm just I get excited and, and I really I, I I really like the um I love the three E's, but I really like the three things about identify risk, understand what it means, and manage it because people jump into things too much sometimes and they don't take the time. I used to not take the time to really assess things before I did it. And hence why I do so much due diligence today. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's an opposite to that, right? Uh, Colin Powell once said, when making a decision, these big decisions, obviously at the highest levels of government, uh, you want about 60% of the information. You don't want 90% because it'll clog your brain and you won't take the action that you yeah. need, but you don't want 40% because you're going to make a mistake. Yeah. And so I think it's important when we talk about managing risk to realize we're not looking for 100% of the information. That's generally impossible. We're looking to have as much information as possible to give us the ability to make great decisions and make them quickly. And the better foundation we build underneath that, that the better we can do that. I love that. 60%. You know, that, that's about right. Uh, 60%. That, that is, that's good. I never put that percentage together, but that is, that's about mm -hmm. right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, he always um, felt like if it was higher, he, he couldn't make a good decision. He, he had waited too long. Well, if you, yeah, if you have to spend that much time gathering hundred percent of the information, you probably already lost the deal because you took yep. too much time trying to make a decision. So you gotta be able to make quick decisions because you know, good deals don't last long. Um, so, guys, I hope you enjoyed the show today. Hit me up at dwanderful.com. I'm on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, like everywhere in the whole world. And if you love the podcast today, if you had fun, if you learned just one little thing, I want you to find Jeremy's podcast. And what is the name of your podcast? Uh, Managing Commercial Real Estate Risk. Okay, Managing Commercial Real Estate Risk. So you go to, and I forgot to ask you about that. I'm sorry. So Managing Commercial Real Estate Risk. So go to his podcast, go to my podcast, subscribe to both, leave us both five-star reviews because all of us in the podcast community are in this together as a team. We're entourage. We're, That's right. we're teams. We're teams and we're all trying to help educate and bring more information to you based on the things that we do. And there's just a whole lot of room in the real estate industry for all kinds of people and all kinds of walks of life. So it's a great industry to be in. And I love it. Jeremy loves it too. So leave us some reviews, follow, subscribe, and do all the good things like that. Okay, so last question of the day. I need you to leave us with a parting word of wisdom, but actually just one single word. I, I think it's opportunity. Okay, you know, I, I think that, yep. I won't expand <laughs> or expound. Yeah. I think opportunity is what you're looking for. The right opportunities. I agree. Okay. So everyone, that's your word of the week is opportunity. And we'll be back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. And remember that the truth is in the red letters. Okay, everybody. Ciao. And Jeremy, thank you so much for being on my show today. I appreciate you. Absolutely. It was wonderful. There you go. Bye, everybody.